here this morning. We're glad that you're here in worship here at Green Oak United Methodist Church on this Lord's Day. I invite you to take a look at your bulletin to see all of that's happening in the, in the life of the church. And in regards to that, uh, this evening is our uh, welcome of uh, the Upper Room Group uh, to Green Oak. Uh, the, uh, drama will start at 6.30. And for those that might not know, uh, the Upper Room Group, they uh, portray uh, through drama the Last Supper. Uh, during uh, during Holy Week, uh, so uh, that will be tonight at 6:30. We'll have a uh, free will offering uh, there uh, before it starts, and we hope that you can attend. Uh, also, uh, the green baskets for the offering uh, time this morning will go towards the Easter egg hunt uh, that will be coming up on April 1st uh, at one o'clock uh, here at the church. So that will be uh, both this week and next week. For the offering time. Are there any other announcements for the good of the church? <coughs> Let's worship God. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The call to worship is in your bulletin in Psalm 70, chapter 71, verses 1 to 3. Would you please stand? In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Be my spirit to me and save me. Be to me my rock of refuge, to which I continually come. For you are my rock and my fortress. Please stand, continue standing for the hymn of praise, Oh, How I Love Jesus. It's in the hymnal, page 170, and we're going to sing all verses. Thank you. 
with a purified you show yourself pure, and with the crooked you make yourself see torturous. For you saved humble people with the haunting eyes you bring down. For it is you who light my hand, the Lord my God lightens my darkness. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord pro proves true. He is a show for all those who take refuge in him. The next piece, the choir anthem, and its wonderful song is wonderful as love melody.
a refuge. You are a mighty fortress and our shield. And in you, you give us grace and strength for our journey of faith. Lord, as we worship you this morning, we ask that you move us from a community of spirit-led worshipers to spirit-filled workers. And as we return to you all that is yours, we ask that you open the doors of our hearts, that we may bear the image of your love, that your fruit would be sown in the harvest, Lord, of souls that have been saved, Lord. We ask that as we gather together, we all may experience your rest and peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we move into our time of lifting up our praises and prayers before God and one another, uh, this morning, uh, one of our uh, beloved was uh, rushed to the hospital, Cindy Ogley, uh, by ambulance. Uh, her blood pressure was pretty low this morning, and so uh, they are continuing to care for her and, and run some tests. And so we want to keep Cindy and Dave and, and Vaughn, who was there with them, and, and all of their family, Debbie, in, in uh, our prayers this morning. Are there any other praises or prayers that are among us today? Love us. Continue. 
prayers for Donna's mother. Yes. And she there, you can see your hand, Donna. But um, she has a joy, I think. She's doing very well. Um, we're just waiting for the lovely insurance to approve her <laughs> inpatient <laughs> rehab. So she's kind of bored, but the floor doesn't want her to leave because they think she's so cute. So, <laughs> but um, she's doing well. Um, she can speak, she gets frustrated. The only thing that she's having trouble with right now is identifying objects. If we tell her, pick up the pen, she'll pick up the pen. If we tell her to point to the pen, she can't do it. So it's just a little bit of a comprehension in her. So that's what we want to get started with her as soon as possible. So um, she's doing very well. Her blood pressure's under control. And um, she's happy. So thank you for all your prayers. Continued praises and prayers for uh, Donna's mom, Loretta. Uh, in case you're unaware, she, she uh, suffered a stroke uh, not much more than a week ago and, and saw her in, in the hospital. And honestly, if I had not seen her uh, or had known that uh, she had the stroke, I would not have known. Uh, she was sitting up and smiling and, and chatting and, and, and socializing with Donna and, and her sisters and, and granddaughter and just having a good time. So we certainly praise God for all that uh, he's doing and her healing and and the day after you left, she says, you're going to have another baby. So she remembered, you're going to have another baby. Praise God. Jim? Yeah, that's still a little under the weather. Uh, she's feeling weak, but uh, coughing a little bit. That's why she didn't want to show up today. She wants to make sure. She's 100% before she gets out the door. Continued prayers of healing and strength for a good bed, uh, possibly feeling a little uh, under the weather. So we want to pray for her. Prayers for Jim, who's going to have some surgery tomorrow. So Jim is next. Prayers for Jim, uh, under doing a procedure tomorrow. We, we, we pray for you, Jim. So we're, we're all Thank you, prayers for you. And, and for the uh, drama tonight. Bless us uh, not only with our great attendance, but uh, that the Lord would speak and move in, in powerful ways. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you in this time as we lift our praises and our prayers before you. And Lord, we, we come humbly because it's only by your grace, Lord, that we are here. And we do give you thanks for each and every person that is here this morning, Lord, whether in person or in spirit. We give you thanks for the young. We give you thanks for the season. We give you thanks for those that have walked with us for generations and generations, and for those, Lord, that we have not yet seen but are waiting to welcome with open and loving arms. Lord, you know each of us by name. You made us in your image and in your likeness. You love us when you created us, and you love us still. And we also give you thanks, Lord, for the ways that you show yourself to us, revealing yourself and the ways that you want to work in us and among us and through us. But Lord, we also ask that today would be a day not only to worship, but to remember that we need you. Not just in the, the good times, but in the times of struggle and that in those moments, Lord, that we need to return to you. And Lord, there are some here today, returning to you with deep struggles in our hearts. And Lord, there's nothing that's too big or too small to be known by you, to be seen and heard by you. Lord, we lift up those who are uh, facing illness and, and medical concern. We lift up to you those uh, whose path in life may have once seemed clear, but now is kind of in a murky haze. There are those this morning, Lord, who are in need of brokenness of relationships to be mended and healed. There are those, Lord, who are wanting to connect with you, that are reaching out with 
voices that are unable to speak. Lord, we pray that you would make a way for all of these things, for understanding, for listening, for wisdom and healing, for breakthroughs, for miracles, for forgiveness, for your blessings and favor and your peace. Lord, we pray not only in the joys and the struggles, but we pray with hearts of faith that you would move and act on your promises, that you would help us carry one another's burdens, that we would rejoice with one another's praises. Bring us, Lord, to a place of surrender, that we would be your church, lived out, that we would know that you are still working among your people. So we ask that we shine your light, that we may experience Jesus, his healing, his deliverance, all made possible through the shedding of his blood, the sacrifice on the cross, and that in his resurrection, our hope is secure. All of this, Lord, we pray through the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of prayer this morning is surely in the presence. Number 328, we'll sing it through twice. Pastor Andrew, I'm just going to text, it's not a stroke. So prayer is answered that Amen. Good text. Praise God for that. Not a stroke. It's indeed. Surely the presence. <laughs> Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, who 
you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, and I, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand, and you shall see, take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of God, the people of God. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this reading of your word, and we pray, Lord, that through your word today that we would connect with we pray that you would meet with us, speak with us, and reveal yourself in a way that doesn't just inform us of who you are, but that you would show yourself in a way that transforms us, your people, into your image, into your glory, as we connect with you and with others in the world. That through your grace, you would dwell in us, in us, in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we come into verse 12, this is where we find Moses. We find him in the tent of meeting, just outside the camp. And this tent has been established uh, as the place where the people would come to seek and connect with God. And in this tent, Moses is talking with the living God, the very creator of the universe. Yet, he's talking to him as one would talk to a friend, face to face. And this is an intimate moment. It's an intense moment. And this is a moment that reveals the inner world of a man who's making his own journey of deliverance. And this is a moment that reveals the character of the Lord God who is both the journey giver and the end destination, both drawing and delivering along the way toward the promised land. But as wonderful as the destination is, the journey to get there brings with it a weightiness that cannot be shaken. And perhaps from our vantage point, it's not the journey itself that carries such a, a heavy burden, but the burden of having to experience the journey alone. For Moses, this fear of journeying alone is on the verge of realization. At the onset of the chapter, God speaks these words to Moses, Depart, go up from here. You and the people, I will send an angel, but I will not go among them. But God, Moses, and Israel have walked so far together. They have experienced so many highs and lows together. Moses has and is growing, and Israel has and is growing. And now Moses, to hear from God, I will not go up among them. Can you imagine the moment? his throat, with a pit in his stomach. How's Israel going to respond when he shares that news? At the sound of this, the people mourn. They stripped themselves bare of anything else that had remained and reminded them of their former life in Egypt. And while Moses meets with God and all of their wailings, the people worship, and they wait to see what God is going to do. And look again to what Moses says to God in verse 12. See, you say to me, Lord, bring up this people, but you haven't let me know whom you will send with me. 
Yet you said, I know you by name, and I've also found favor in your sight. And Moses asks in verse 13, he says, Lord, show me your ways that I may know you. In other words, Moses says, God, I want to connect with you in relationship so I know your way. I want to know you in such a way that I don't have to second guess which way the path is going. I want to know you in such a way that I can discern what is from you and what is not. To know your voice when you speak and when you're silent. To know you in such a way that all of my mind and heart and soul and strength is wrapped up in you. Show me your ways, Lord. I want to know you. And here Moses is pledging his radical allegiance and dependence upon God and God alone. Because he knows he can't make the journey alone. He knows that. And in his prayer, Moses is crying out, Father, Abba, Daddy, don't leave me. I need you. And if you yourself aren't going with us, you need to send your presence here through someone or something else that I may know the way, that we may know the way, because if you're not going with us, this journey just isn't the same. And not only is this journey just not the same, the journey if God is not there, if God is not present right in the midst of it, guiding and leading and speaking and dwelling with his people, the journey is no longer worth it. And yet, that kind of response doesn't satisfy Moses. It's not acceptable. It's not in Moses' vocabulary or spirit to settle in that way. Because Moses wants nothing less than a close, intimate relationship with God. And in fact, he wants more and more and more of God. Some of us might struggle with this aspect of knowing when it comes to our relationship. Some may only understand the meaning of relationship purely in, in human form, from a human lens. And we bring into our, our relationship with God our own, our own understandings based on our earthly experiences of relationships with others. And maybe for some of us, that makes us uncomfortable. If we're really honest, if we add the word intimate on top of that, that might scare us. Intimacy scares us because maybe at some point in our past we were once intimate in relationship and got hurt in some pretty harmful or horrendous ways. Maybe the word intimate scares us because, and I'm going to gently pick on the men here, men, we think being intimate makes us less of a, a manly man. But guys, if you want to see the true definition of a manly man, here it is. In Moses. Maybe the word intimate scares us because we only think it's referring to some stereotypical, overly cheesy, hallmark romanticism. Maybe the word intimate scares us because in our earthly experience we've never seen true intimate faith modeled in a healthy way. Beloved, we need to correct our lenses on what true intimacy is. We need to correct our understanding of what consists as an intimate relationship with God. This isn't the kind of connection with God where you're trying to guess whether or not you're listening to a love song or someone in a deep relationship with the living God. True intimacy goes so much further than that, into the depths of the soul, well below the surface. It has immense delight. It has significant struggle and wrestle. True intimacy has weight. It has substance. And true intimacy finds connection anchored in God alone. It's within this deep connection that our voices cry out, Lord, I want to know you, and I want to know you more. No matter where I am, no matter what the cost, where you are is where I want to be. And in his relationship with God, Moses never wants to keep God at arm's length. It's a knowing that it's not just to know something about God. It's a knowing that through relationship that there's a blessing that is so good in many ways, it, it's also mysterious and indescribable. I want to find favor in your sight, Moses says. Lord, I know the kind of man that I am, and I know the man that I am always falls short of who you call me to be, and I don't want to be that man. I want to rise up to your level, to your standard. And I need from you, Lord, your favor, your affirmation that I am still your man. I want to find favor in your sight. 
And that favor that Moses is looking for isn't some reward with a whole bunch of catch-22s or strings attached. It's not mechanical or manipulative. And in fact, this favor can't even be linked to human performance or lack thereof. The word for, in Hebrew for favor here is grace. And it's a grace that is unmerited. It's a grace given to a person or a people who find themselves constantly in need. It's a grace gifted that says, this is simply because I love you. You haven't earned it. You may even screw up royally, but you're still my person. You're still my people. And I still love you. Through intimate personal encounters, Moses asks for the grace that God will continually speak to his heart. Moses seeks to know and experience God's presence and favor through grace, through mercy, through compassion, through continuing to meet with him, and through God's responding to him, answering favorably to his prayers. And in this prayer, Moses includes Israel. He says, don't forget, Lord, this nation is your people. Remember what you said, God. They're your treasure, your kingdom of priests, your holy nation, and you promised that. This is journey deliverance isn't just for me, it's for them too. And I imagine Moses perhaps without maybe taking another breath, getting ready to continue, God silences Moses for a moment and says, my presence will go with you. Maybe in your relationship with God right now, you're doubting the validity of God's presence. Maybe you've experienced God once in your life, but maybe now some time has passed. And maybe there's some things that have happened in your life between then and now that you just can't seem to shake because of its weight. And maybe that's causing you not only to doubt God's presence, but that you'll never be able to experience God's peace. Beloved, when you seek after God in the way that Moses is seeking after God, with total abandonment of self and abide in His presence, you will experience a true and certain anchor of God's perfect peace and rest in your life. Now, as I've said before, this rest doesn't mean that your life will be trouble-free. In fact, it might even mean you have more trouble. But when you encounter these dangers, when you encounter these distresses along the way, you will be able to declare, not with a willy-nilly, well, I hope so. You can declare with certainty Time and time again, standing in assurance, I know that I know that I know that I know. I know God so deeply, so intimately, so personally, that God will come for me. God will rescue me. God will save me. God will provide everything that I need. And he'll protect me along the way. I don't just need to seek God merely for his benefits or favorable circumstances in my life, but I seek God so that I may continue to know him and experience him more. That in the words of Horatio Spafford, whatever my life thou hast taught me to say, I know that it is well with my soul. That, beloved, is the rest and peace of one who has come to seek God's presence, who knows God intimately and trustingly and securely rests, anchored in the shalom of God's promised land. Now you might say, well, that's crazy talk. You can't be serious. I'd have to be a totally different person. I can't do that. And you're absolutely right. And I am totally serious. Moses says, Lord, there's something that happens when you're with us. If you're not going with us, how will we know that you're for us and not against us? And the people know that I've been with you and they've heard from you, and that it's your word that I bring that offers the people life. If everything we are, everything we have, our identity, our being is rooted in you, Lord, if you're not going with us, then what is the difference between us and everyone else? If our worship is anything but centered on Christ, it's a cult. If our church is a structure without Christ, it is merely a building. If the church is a people without Christ, it is not unlike any social club or organization. So do we back to our relationship with Christ enough, with enough intimacy, enough dependency, enough urgency to dare to be different? 
Moses dared to be different in his dependency upon God, that in him Moses might live differently in the world. And in this prayer, God reassures Moses again, the very thing you've spoken of, Moses, I will do. I, you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. But Moses still isn't satisfied. He doesn't care about the things that God will do for him. And that's great that God has granted his request. But the, Moses doesn't see God as some sort of vending machine God that you put in the quarter, press the button, and out comes your, your choice. He doesn't see God as some sort of divine genie that you rub the magic lamp and I'll grant you your wishes. What God does and the blessings that God rewards means nothing to Moses if Moses doesn't have God himself with him and around him and going ahead of him and coming behind him. In this prayer, in this conversation with God, Moses, he's increasing his intensity and he's increasing his persistence. He's increasing his demand for God to be experienced and made known. And he prays, Lord, I want to know you so intimately well that I want to know your ins and your outs, your comings and your goings, your thoughts and your will and your plans. Lord, show me your glory. That's what Moses prays in verse 18. Lord, let me be at the very center of who you are, the very center of your essential character. I want to know your truest, purest, most holiest of ways. I want to know your majesty and your splendor. Show me your glory, Lord. And I think it's here at this point that I can hear the voice of Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise in the back of my head from a few good men. You want answers? Yeah, I think I'm entitled to them. You want answers? I want the truth. And you can't handle the truth. When it comes to God's glory, not only can we not handle the truth, we're not able to stand in the presence of God's full glory. God never responds directly to Moses' requests. And it's not like the matter's up for debate or that we can negotiate with God or receive an answer that we believe we're entitled to. There's some aspects of God's revelation, God's glory, that are only reserved for God to see and know and choose to unveil. And yet God gives as much of himself to Moses that Moses can handle. God can't show Moses his glory because it's too dangerous. But as he walks before Moses, he gives Moses the grace to experience as much of his God's goodness as Moses can bear. And it's very act, this very act of God's goodness that grounds Moses with the certainty in who God is and that he will fulfill all he says he will do. Is God's goodness enough? Is God's goodness enough to have the power to draw us in or send us forth transformed? And it's not because... God sent Moses his goodness instead of his glory that the goodness of God is somehow lacking. That it's somehow a lesser part of God. In all of God's attributes, in all of his ways, in all of his revelations to us, God is good. God is good in all of his knowledge and power and presence. God is good in his jealousy, in his love, in his wrath, in his truth, and in his grace. And the list goes on and on and on. Because if God wasn't fully good, if God wasn't fully God in any of these things, as somehow in lack, God would not be God. It's not God who lacks. It's not God who somehow needs to be explained or have a reason for the whys and what he does. It's us, as God's creation, who need to be formed into God's goodness. If God were to reveal himself in full revelation, we would surely die. And that's what he tells Moses in verse 20. Moses, you can't see my face and live. That is why for now, Moses, you need my presence and protection and promise in your life. But even so, Moses, there are things about me that you can't simply understand. There are things about me that must simply remain a mystery. And it's in this veil of mystery that God reveals his goodness. And he says, Behold, Moses, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my goodness, my glory passes by, I will put you on the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back. 
but my face shall not be seen. In other words, God says, Moses, I'm going to reveal myself to you in a totally brand new way. I'm going to reveal as much of myself as I can to you, but there's a part of me that's also going to remain a mystery. And when I pass by you, Moses, I'm going to cover you with my hand. And it's because I love you, Moses, that I do this. I do this to protect you from the weight and the magnitude of my glory. But after I pass by Moses, I'll remove my hand. And not only will you be able to see me in part, but you will also be able to see the places where I have been. Isn't that beautiful? That Moses, as he looks at God's back, just doesn't see this, this form of God and his divine goodness. But he sees all the places where God has walked in between. Through Moses getting to see in the God in the way that he does in the cleft of the rock, God reminds Moses and us that our stories of deliverance aren't over. That God is not finished yet. And when we ourselves are seeking after God in the intimate, personal way that Moses did, the miraculous happens. We not only get to be in the company of God's presence, but we get to see all the places where God's glory and goodness has been. And it's this very weight of God's glory that caused Simon to fall down before the feet of Jesus and cry out, Lord, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. It was the weight of God's bright, shining glory that caused Saul to become blind and fall to the ground, crying, Who are you, Lord? And yet it was through God's goodness and grace that Simon's name was changed to Peter, the rock, and Saul's to Paul. And it was through God's goodness and grace that his name would be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. And that people of earth would experience God's saving grace and mercy and compassion. And for all of God's children, God offers this invitation to come and follow me. Go make all disciples of all nations all to the glory of God. When we follow that trail, beloved, we find ourselves returning to the rock in whom God has placed his full glory, his full self, in Christ Jesus. We find this in John's Gospel. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the Father, only the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For out of his fullness we have received grace and on grace. No one has ever seen God, only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. You know, every time I read these last few verses of, of Exodus 33, I can't help but think of no other rock that I'd rather be hidden in than the rock of Christ. I can't help but think of the lyrics to the hymn, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be a sin of double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Lord, we make that our prayer today. Our prayer, Lord, is that we would be hidden in you. That we would desire to seek after you, to know you more and more. Lord, along our journey of deliverance in your story of salvation, you accompany us along the way. And as we walk along this road, Lord, we catch all these little glimpses of your goodness and your grace. Lord, you're always a God who is on the move. Always moving from grace to grace, from death to life, from despair to deliverance. And Lord, we give you thanks for your very presence. We give you thanks for your guidance and for your protection. We give you thanks for the way that you speak to us. As we would speak to a friend. And yet, Lord, none of this matters. We don't have you. If we can't have you. Lord, lead us into your place where your presence and your peace and rest in us. Lead us to the true rock of ages who has laid down the foundation of our faith. 
Christ Jesus. Lord, we want to know him, to experience him deeply, personally, intimately. And Lord, we as your church, as we proclaim your name, we ask that you would strengthen us for the work that you've called us to fulfill in the world. That we would indeed experience your glory in your presence, in your promise, in your peace that awaits us in your promised land. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we wait for the promised land and make the journey of faith in our lives, let us uh, sing this hymn together, Be with me, O blessed God, verses 1 and 3.